Good morning, everyone. My name is Helen Miller from Ohio EPA, and we'll be starting the webinar in approximately one minute to give people a chance to continue to log on. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Navigating Ohio EPA's eBusiness Center, Tips and Tools for EDMR and Stream Services. My name is Helen Miller with the Division of Environmental and Financial Assistance here at Ohio EPA, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Our speaker today is Jacob Zink from our Division of Surface Water. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items to help you participate and engage with the presenter today. On this slide, you see a screenshot of your attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop on the right-hand side of your screen. For this webinar, you are listening in using your computer audio. If you're having sound issues or if the slides stop advancing, please try refreshing your browser. If that doesn't work, try logging off and logging back in. Please feel free to submit questions to the presenter by clicking on the question mark icon and typing them into the questions pane on the attendee interface. You may send questions in at any time during the presentation. We'll do our best to answer questions as they come in. We'll also address some commonly asked questions during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. If we're not able to respond to your question during the webinar, we will reach out to you via email after the webinar. To view and download the handouts, please click on the documents icon on your attendee interface. A copy of the PowerPoint slides is a PDF are also included. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email after the webinar with a link to the recording and a link to the session survey. The survey will also pop up once the webinar ends. We value your feedback and would greatly appreciate it if you let us know how we're doing and let us know if there's anything we can do to further assist you. Please note, you will be sent your certificate of attendance in a separate email from an Ohio EPA staff member today, several days after the webinar, not from the GoToWebinar platform. This webinar is approved for one contact hour toward wastewater operator certification. To receive credit, you must attend the entire webinar and it must be the primary window open on your screen for more than 90% of the time. You must also participate in all live polling questions. There are three polling questions throughout the one hour webinar. To make sure you can see the polls, please maximize your screen. If you miss a poll question, please send in a question in the Q&A panel. That way in the report, we can see you are actively participating in the webinar. If you're seeking wastewater operator certification contact hours, please provide your core person ID in the post webinar survey so we can submit on your behalf to the certified operator program. This webinar is also approved for one hour of registered environmental health specialist and environmental health specialist in training credit. To receive credit for attending, please provide your REHS or EHSIT number in the post webinar survey so Ohio EPA can submit on your behalf to the Ohio Department of Health. If you have questions on CEUs, please refer to the CEU fact sheet in the document section of the attendee interface. With that, I'm going to turn, turn it over to today's presenter, Jacob Zink. Thank you, Helen. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Zink, and like she said, I am the e-business person go-to for surface water. And today we're going to talk about specifically about EDMR and streams. And just a little background about me: I've been with the EPA here coming up on two years now. Um, and prior to this, I was working for Battelle, Anheuser Busch, and Colgate Palmolive in different lab settings. All right, to start off, we're going to do a, one of the poll questions. So this question is, did you know it is a good idea to have a backup more than one person with the authority to submit EDMRs for a facility? Yes or no? Okay, and I am launching the poll, so please make your selection once that pops up on your screen. And again, if you are Going for the op search credit, please be sure that you answer all three live polls today. And 
It looks like most people have voted. If you have not made your selection yet, please go ahead and make your selection. And I will be closing the poll shortly. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share the results. All right, there awesome, yep. Looks like most people have got that correct. So yep, it is a good idea to always have more than one person. This um, prevents any you know late submitting or any issues when somebody leaves or is let go with a company. All right, so accounts and who needs them. I click too fast, there we go. So these accounts are for each individual person, not a company. You might be doing different company work-related stuff in these accounts, but they are ultimately assigned to you. Um, the reason for this is because OHID is, so it's your personal portal where you can do multiple things in there besides the EPA. So for example, on my personal one, I do use it for the BMV. Um, I send it, work through that to send like registration for my car through the mail so I never have to go to the BMV in person because we all know how long those lines are. Um, and some small business will do like personal tax information there. So, you know, you don't want your personal company looking at all that information. So the, that's why these accounts are your own thing and they're assigned to your electronic signature. And remember that OHID is not EPA's website. It is the state of Ohio's website. So think of it as your phone. You unlock your phone. That's like you getting into OHID, all the apps on your phone. That's all the different type of state agencies that you can access. And then the eBusiness Center is one of those apps within OHID. And that's where you create your account so you can use the eBusiness Center for the EPA. Uh, remember to keep your emails personal. I know a lot of people do end up using work-related emails. That causes issues when you leave the company or get a different job somewhere else. Um, usually those emails are not accessible anymore. You know, they'll deactivate them. So that causes problems when you try to get back into your account to do something with your new company. And then that's where all that issues come from. And remember, never share your password or username because that, these accounts are tied to you. So if anyone was logged in as you, they are technically forging your name if they were to ever submit something in your account. Just also keep that in mind. That's why we don't share pins or passwords. And like I said, if you change jobs, the accounts go with you. They don't stay with the company. Oop, went too fast there. All right, accounts and who needs them? The legal permit holder for the facility also needs their own account. The legal permit holder is also known as the responsible official. Um, when they create an account, it just keeps everything smoother operations. There's there's lots of things the RO can do in the account to manage their permit and the people that can submit different reports for that permit. So keep that in mind. It you know makes the process a little faster in case you're coming up on the 20th you realize oh shoot i need to get somebody in here to submit this you know the ro can do it instantly on their account whereas if you do it through your own account you're going to have to download a form that has to be sent back to us for approval and i'll explain that here in a little more detail here coming up but a pin once you create an account you will have to activate a pin for your account this pin cannot be changed whatever the system creates it as will be your pin forever as long as you have your account and that is equal to your electronic signature for your account and you can always view your pin anytime on your account um, in case you forget it because it is such a weird combination of special characters and numbers and letters um, it is easy to forget it in this place um, we use an outside system called LexisNexis to identify to use excuse me to i uh, to um, identify you as you're the person that's making the account to verify that you are who you are and you know someone random is not trying to create the account for you all right just to step back a little bit here there are guides on the website not a lot of people know that these exist so i just want to go over those real quick so the guides can help you navigate the e-business center and all the different services within the e-business center for surface water so in order to find that, you're just going to go to your web browser, type in Ohio EPA, scroll down on that page until you get to the division section, and then toggle all the way over until you get to the surface water, and then click on surface water. It's going to take you to this page on the left here. You will find there is a permitting section. If you click on that, it will then take you to the page on the right, 
You'll scroll down a little bit to find the e-business center or electronic business services. And then you'll be located here on this page. Here you'll find some useful information. If it's your first time creating an account, I've included a, you know, how to get started with OHID and eBiz um, guide right here. My contact information is always on the right hand side. Um, la the launch button is to get into OHID specifically. It just takes you directly to OHID to log in. And then here below the different accordions drop down here, you can see there's different ones for EDMR, streams, how to pay things online. Here's where you can find all the different types of guides for those specific services. And if you were to click on one, it would look like this. So if you clicked on the EDMR, you would see the guides here and some other useful information. And then if you clicked on the stream service, you will then find the guides for streams and guides on how to fill out the reports in streams. So going back a little bit, OHID is always gonna be your starting point. Um, so whether you go, however you get there, it will always redirect you, the website will always redirect you to OHID. That is your personal account, like I said, you will log in there. And again, it's not run by the EPA, it's run by the state of Ohio. And remember, this is not your eBiz account. Some people will think that OHID is the eBusiness Center. I know it says like in the left-hand image here, it does say eBusiness Center, and then there's the OHID button to click on. I know that can be confusing, but it is not the eBusiness Center. In fact, it is just specifically OHID, and then there's your account for the state of Ohio with all the different services in it. Once you log into OHID for the first time and get your account all set up, you will see the images here. So on the left, for your first time, you always just go to the App Store because this is where you're going to search for the different apps within OHID. So if you're searching for the EPA, for example, I usually just type in Ohio EPA and then search. When you do that, or excuse me, you can also filter by the EPA. Um, if you don't filter by this, when you hit search, all these filters will expand. Some people think that's the apps or what's, that's what they're looking for. Um, that's not the case. So what you're gonna do is scroll down all the way on that page to find the actual apps, like down here, of what the system found for your search criteria. So when you find the app you're looking for, for example, it's gonna be this one right here. It's gonna have the Ohio EPA's logo followed by the eBusiness Center. When it's your first time accessing it, it'll say request access to group. So you're gonna click on that, follow the next couple, um, instructions that tells you on this page to get set up with your eBiz account. For the first time, when you do that, it's gonna ask you to fill in a couple more information. Um, it'll ask, some of your information will be already in there because of your OHID account, it's tied together, but you'll have to put in like your title, I think another email, phone number, address, um, things like that, it's just gonna, and after you do that for the first time, that's the only time you have to do it, it'll sync up with OHID, so the next time you log in, like in my screen here, it'll say open up, and then from there, you'll be directed directly to the eBiz homepage. But if for some reason you never see it under My Apps, because sometimes when you go into view an app, it'll put it under your My Apps, but you can also favorite it here to make sure it stays here. Um, but if you never see it here, it's gone, don't worry. Just go back to the App Store and search for it again. Sometimes OHID acts a little funny sometimes, and that can happen. All right, so once you're into the eBusiness Center, here's the main page you're gonna see. This is the what we call the main eBusiness Center homepage, and you'll see all the different services on the left-hand side available with some other you know, information on the right here. When it's your first time getting an account, what you wanna do next is go to the My Account drop down at the top, just like the image in the bottom here. This is what it looks like when I you have a pin activated. So when it doesn't have a pin activated, you'll click My Account, and that's gonna say Request new pin. You're going to click on that and follow the next steps on those next pages. Um, if you get stuck in that process, feel free to call me because it is kind of a, it doesn't tell you necessarily the next steps to take, so it can be a little confusing. Just call me and I'll get you sorted out and get your pin activated. But once your pin is good to go, you're going to see this. So whenever you need your pin, if you forgot it, you wrote it down somewhere, can't find it, you can always go to your My Account, Pin Management, and then View Pin. When you click on view pin, it's gonna ask you for one of your security questions that you made up in the process of creating your pin. So as long as you remember your questions, you can locate your pin for your account. If for some reason you cannot remember your questions, give me a call and we can troubleshoot um, some options for you so you can get back in to see what your pin is. So once your pin's all good to go, um, this, this, sorry, not prevents, this allows you to submit within the eBusiness Center. So that's why you need a pin first, especially if you plan to submit reports for EDMR. 
So say now you have your pin all good to go, and now you want to get access for EDMR. This is where the right-hand column in this facilities column comes into play. You'll go down to the view edit option for the EDMR row. You'll click on that, and then it's gonna give you the option to add a facility to your account so you can submit for EDMRs. So before we, I go into the process of how you get that added to your account, I'm just gonna go over some of the terminology like responsible official and delegate submitter first. So for EDMR, the legal permit holder, also known as a responsible official, um, they are gonna need to have an account themselves. Uh, I've run into multiple scenarios where someone, you know, they don't know who your RO is, the RO doesn't have an account, they don't want an account. If they don't want an account, um, tell them to reach out and call me. We'll discuss why you need an account, you know, why the federal regulations, what it all says, and just how convenient it is for your facility to have your own account so you can manage people and the permit under it. So that way you know what's going on with your permit as a responsible official because you are the legal permit holder. And then likewise, if you're not the legal permit holder, then you are going to be known as the delegate submitter. And that's someone who can submit on behalf of the responsible official or legal permit holder. The responsible official has to authorize another person to report for DMRs on their behalf so they can do this within their own account. So that's why I recommend they always have an account because they can add someone in about five minutes or less to report for EDMR. It's quick, there's no form, it's instant access, and it just you know, speeds up the process. So, but likewise, if you're a delegate submitter, you have to get all, obviously authorization from the RO to submit. And so if you don't know who the RO is, you're not sure who that might be in your company, but you know you need to get this service for yourself. So if you request the service on your own account, you're gonna go through the steps that I'll go through in here in a little bit, and you'll request to be the delegate submitter. When you do that, a form will download, and that form has to be signed by the RO and sent back to us before you can get approved. So both ways, you know, the RO can grant you instant access, or you can submit the form to the RO to submit back to us. Both ways get you access, but obviously one is a lot quicker and more efficient than the other. And of course, the main reason services requests are denied is the wrong role was chosen in the process. And I briefly mentioned a little bit when you're first creating your EBIS account, there is a way for you to put in a title of what you are for your facility. That's where that comes into play. So if your title changes for for you throughout your career, you can always go into your EBIS center and update that. So if you go to apply for the RO role, say you got you know a promotion, you're you're now the head honcho and you want to be the response official rather than delegate submitter, well, if you had your previous title of what you were, say it was operator, that's going to get denied if you request to be an RO because operators cannot be ROs. So just keep that in mind. And if you ever need help changing that title, feel free to give me a call and I can help you show you where that is. So the response official does not mean the same thing for like it does for streams and EDMR as it does for other services. So keep that in mind. Like um, Air, you know, all those different services have different terminology that they use, but response official is a um, one that's used a lot and it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. I know that's confusing. It's confusing for us too and annoying, but it is how the system is set up. So for example, if you are an ORC, operator of record, and within those requirements, it sometimes refers to you as a response official. That's referring to that service only and not streams or EDMR. So the response official is usually going to be the owner, president, you know, vice president, chief financial officer, CEO. If it's a public facility, it's going to be the mayor or the mayor's office, an elected official. Um, so keep that in mind for your facility. So if you're not the legal permit holder, then you are not the response official. Therefore, you're most likely going to be the delegate submitter. And again, just to reiterate, response officials need their own accounts and pins so that way they can, um, you know, manage their facility, manage the people under them. And there can also be more than one RL. So it doesn't have to be, you never have to use one only. Same thing with delegate submitters. You can have as many ROs O's as you want and as many delegate submitters as you want. That way you won't have issues when it comes time for submitting the reports. Um, you'll be able to get them in on time. And again, if you're not sure, you know, if you are the legal permit holder, ask yourself these bulleted points here. Um, are you, you know, can you, are you available to know when there's violations and making sure they're reported? Do you have the authority and resources, you know, money, staff to resolve violations? Um, are you certifying that the information submitted is, you know, correct and accurate? 
Um, and are you aware that there are any significant penalties for submitting false information? All that good stuff. You know, if that sounds like the type of job responsibilities you have, then you might be the RL. But if you're still not sure, I would always recommend reaching out to either your, um, some of your superiors in management, or if you have a legal department, you can always reach out to them and show them, actually, I think it was on the slide before. Yes, this, there's a link right here for the 40 CFR. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry, there we go. Okay. Um, you can always show that to your legal department and show them that, hey, you know, is this me? Do I meet these requirements? And they can, they can usually quickly tell you, no, that's not you, or yes, it is. And then the RO is also responsible for notifying the EPA if others will be collecting data, submitting reports on their behalf. Um, that's what I kind of talked about before, you know, when the RO submits the access for someone to be instant access for submitting EDMRs, that's them notifying the EPA that, you know, through the system that, hey, I give this person um, approval to submit, or same thing with the delegated form. If that's get emailed to me, that's saying, hey, you know, the RO has seen this, they're, and they're giving permission for so-and-so to be submitting these reports on my behalf. So this screen here, this is just a quick like overview of what your permit number means. So what the number in the beginning, that's your uh, district. So what location you are in Ohio, as you can see the little map here in the bottom that determines what district you're in. Uh, the next is like your category, and then you have the type of facility you are, and then the system generates the numbers after that. But then after the asterisk is your version number. So if it's A, that means that's like most likely the first permit in that sequence, and it'll change to B, you know, when you go to renew, or if you create a modification, that'll change that version number. So make sure you're always up to date on your the most recent version for your permit. The OH number down here, that is the US EPA's number naming system. A lot of people think that's their number. When I ask for a permit number, they'll start saying that. Um, that is your permit number, but that's the permit number for the entire state. But you'll have your unique NPDES permit number um, for your facility. It's like your, it's like a social security number. It's unique to your facility, your facility only. It never changes and it won't be shared with another facility. If you ever need to locate your permit, say you're on streams, you can also view it on the stream service in your e-business center. I'll go through that later. But if you can't find it there, if it's not downloading properly, you can actually go to the website, our website. And like I said earlier, um, you'll go to the permitting section or you can just click this link right here. But it's located there. You can find all the active permits and you can search for your permit number there. And then you can download it that way as well. All right, I'm gonna take another real short quiz here. All right, so is authorization needed for submittal of an EDMR and who could give me authorization? Okay, I am launching the poll, so go ahead and make your selection as it pops up on your screen. And also just a quick reminder to people that were logging on maybe a couple, a minute or so late, uh, there is a copy of the PowerPoint slides as a PDF file. If you go to your documents icon, you can go ahead and download that. Looks like most people have voted. If you have not, go ahead and make your final selection so I can close the poll. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results. There you go, Jacob. All righty, yep, so most of you have got it correct. So yes, the responsible official or the legal permit holder is what who gives you authorization. The EPA approves you when you, if you come through. If the RO doesn't give you instant access and you submit that delegation form, like I mentioned, the EPA approves you, but the person giving you the authorization to submit is your responsible official for your permit. Okay. Okay, just some quick like tips and tricks for EDMR. 
Um, DMRs are always created on the first of every month. Um, if for some reason you go in, you check and it's not there, um, check with your permit because sometimes it pulls information based on what your permit says. Um, just verify that, yes, there should be something here because I have daily, you know, entries I have to make. Um, if it's still, you know, if it's not there, reach out to me. We'll get that sorted out for you. The DMRs, they're always due on the 20th. There's no, you know, ifs, ands, or buts about it. No exceptions. It is always due on the 20th. Um, you have 20 days to report. So, you know, there should be no reason for late reporting. The RO, like I said earlier, can authorize more than one individual to report EDMRs on their behalf. Instant access, as long as the RO has an account. And, you know, you can, you know, say it's the 19th, like I said, and the RO can go in about five minutes, give you access, and then you have plenty of time to submit so you don't get dinged for a late submittal. And of course, make sure you have a backup person to submit. Um, the person, you know, that's the backup, they might not ever have to use the account. Maybe how you guys have your system set up where there is only one person submitting, but, you know, say that one person's out, they're on vacation, they're sick, you know, family issue comes up, they can't, they can't submit on, for the 20th. You know, that backup person can at least have an account all ready to go. And they can, you know, if they haven't submitted in a while, they can still call me and I can help them get that submitted on time. Uh, again, plan sampling early, get results back on time, um, set reminders on your calendar to enter your data. I'll talk about this here a little later too, but the Excel version is super handy. I recommend using that. Um, even if you don't have a lot of data to enter, it's just, to me, it's a lot more user-friendly if you know how to use Excel. And then enter data as you get it. This way you don't have to log in for the Excel. You can just enter the data in your Excel template that's saved on your desktop. You won't ever have to log in and make sure it's saved in our system. And then when when all your data you know is entered for that entire month entire month then you can go in and just log in once to submit the the, the data the sample points but i'll talk about that here in a little bit so accessing edmrs hey jake um yes. we've had a couple requests of if you can slow down a little bit you're covering so much information quickly <laughs> yeah sure All right, so accessing EDMRs. So as I mentioned earlier, when you go to actually request, so say your delegate submitter, at least that's what you're, you know, you're going to submit for in your eBusiness account. You don't know who the RO is, so you're going to request the service yourself. So when you log in and go into the main eBusiness Center homepage, you will click on that View Edit for the EDMR row. Once you do that, it's going to take you to this next page here. Here's where you'll see the Add Facility button. If you do not see this Add Facility button, that is a good indicator that you don't have your PIN activated for your account. And like I said earlier, if you need to see if you do have a PIN, if it's activated or not, just go to the My Account at the top left up here. Click that. If you have a PIN, it'll say PIN Management. If you don't, it'll say Request, you know, Request Access to Activate Your PIN. So just keep that in mind. So if you don't see this, you need to activate your PIN first because you need a PIN to submit any EDMR. So that's why it wants you to do that first. Once you click Add Facility, you'll see this screen come up here. The only one you really have to worry about is this first box. The regulatory program ID is your permit number. So as long as you know what your permit number is, type it in. Make sure you leave off the asterisk and the two letters after it. That's just the version number. You don't need that to search for it. And then once you type that in, click the search button and it will should pull up your information for you. If for some reason, you know, you're, you have it typed in right, you don't have the, the asterisk and the two letters after it on there, you don't have any other information, I still can't find it, uh, let me know, give me a call. Sometimes we have to do something in the behind the scenes to make sure that works for you. But once you hit search, it'll pull up on the left hand screen here you'll see this information, the name, the address. As long as this all looks good, um, you can continue the next step. If it doesn't, you can always hit the search again button. But as long as this looks good, this blue link right here for the core agency core ID number, it'll be like a highlighted blue. Go ahead and click on that. It'll then take you to the image on the right here. Kind of takes you back to where we started. The reason it does that is it gives you the option to add another facility if you're going to you know, request access to multiple at one time. If you're just doing it for one, that's fine. There should be a next button available now. So you can go ahead and click on that to get to the next page. 
And here's where I mentioned earlier when I talked about the different roles, this is where that comes into play. So, you know, if you're the responsible official requesting access, that's fine. Just make sure you check mark that box and then, you know, check mark the I have read and put in your PIN information. Um, you won't have a form downloaded when you are a responsible official requesting access. So keep just something to keep in mind. When you do request responsible official access, it comes to me and then I will approve you usually within um, 24 hours. And then if you select the delegate submitter role, that's when the form is going to be downloaded right after you hit submit. So make sure you get that form sent over to your response official so they can initial and sign it. The person requesting access to be a delegate submitter does not need to do anything with the form. Your information will already be automatically on the form itself. So you don't actually have to, have to do anything to that. So you just send it over to the RO, RO gets it initial and signed, and then they email it back to me so I can approve you. All right, so say I got the form, the delegation form from your response official, and then I went and approved you. You'll get an auto email saying that you have been approved, and then you'll be able to actually go in and click on the actual EDMR service now. Same thing, if the RO gives you instant access, you'll also be able to go click on that EDMR service. It just happens a lot quicker, like I said. So say you're now you're ready to look at the report, edit it, and maybe submit. So now you'll click on EDMR, when you do that, it's gonna open the page on the right here. This is like an information page. It'll, we'll have issues, you know, if there's any issues going on with EDMR, I'll try to put warnings messages here. And there's also always guides right here in case you need to look up guides for EDMR in case you're having some issues. Then on the left-hand side here of the same page, this is where you'll go to find your reports. So you'll click on view reports to be brought to that next page where you'll see all the reports for your permit. All right, so when you clicked on view reports, here's the image that you're gonna see. There's a few, you know, like cells you can click in here. Um, don't ever type in anything in here because it wants you to use the drop down because you, since you have to be assigned, um, you know, as a delegate submitter to the facility slash permit, it has to be, it's in the system that way. So like, you can't just type it in, you have to be assigned it first and then you can pull down and select the facility you need. So click that drop down, select your facility, the next option will highlight for permit. You'll click that drop down. Make sure there's usually more than one permit listed here in this drop down, based on your what you have for your facility. But make sure you click on, like I said, the most recent permit version. And then these, I usually leave, leave the new open and submitted all check marks unless you're looking for something very specific. And then just make sure the date range goes far back enough to where you're going to be looking for the real reports in case you need to submit older ones. As long as everything is good there for your search criteria, hit that go button. And then down below here is where all the reports that have been generated by the system will be available for you. It's always going to give you the most recent one that's been generated at the top. And then you'll be able to scroll down. It's kind of cut off on my page here, but there is a scroll bar here. You can scroll down and see all the different reports. Some things to keep in mind here. The status, if it has a status of new, that means it's been recently generated by the system. and nobody has looked at it yet. If it has a status of open, that means somebody, in this case, it looks like this person might have been in it last. They might have added some data to it and saved it and got out of it, and that's just what that means. And then, of course, submitted means it's been submitted. Um, I'll mention what other issues you can have with submitted, but as long as you see submitted, transfer to SWIMS, you are good to go, and that means the EPA has received it. All right, so say you're ready to go in and actually look at the report itself. There's action buttons on the far left-hand side of all reports. You'll click that, and then the image over here is what you'll see. You can go in and ent enter the data in manually to the online report. If there's issues with the report, say you don't see something that's generated correctly based on what your permit says. You can try to hit delete form. It'll regenerate the new form automatically. Sometimes that fixes a bug in the system. Sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't, obviously reach out to me and we'll get that sorted out, but that's something to keep in mind what that's for. And here's that download Excel option I was talking about a little bit earlier. This will be your, your best friend because this gives you what you see on your online report in an Excel template version. So if, if you click on that, you can save it to your desktop and then you can just close out of this whole report over here 
and then just keep the Excel template on your desktop to enter data as you go instead of logging in every time to enter the data. So here's what the online report looks like. So say you want to enter it manually, this is what it looks like. If you don't have anything to report for that month, and so you would just select the no discharge, the information below will disappear and then you'll just have to click continue until you get the submit page and you'll be good to go there. If you use the Excel template version, that's where this copy and paste feature comes from. So say you have your Excel template all ready to go, what you're gonna do is just copy all the data and or the sample information in the comments and then click this copy and paste feature a dialog box will pop up with a blank white box just click in that box hit paste it'll look really weird at first but that's okay on that same box that pops up there's an update table button click that because that's the only way it's going to take that information and put it down below here and then once you do that it's going to put all the information and comments in here and then you can just hit continue to get to the submit page and submit so it just makes it, it's a little bit less more clicking involved compared to when you're adding a comment in here, which I'll mention here in a little bit, but that's just something to keep in mind. And also check your frequencies. If it says one per day, the system is looking for a data point or sample in every single box. If it's one per month, it's only looking for one sample point for that month. So just keep that in mind. Here's what the Excel template would look like if you choose to use it. You know, as you can see, it's laid out very similar to online form. Your parameters are all at the top. Your frequencies are here. In this case, it says when discharging, and then it lays out all the different days in that month. Just to recap too on the A codes, um, you can find them on our website and they're also on the online report itself, right where that copy paste feature button was a little bit ago. It's right beside that as well. You can download the A codes and see if you need to use any. Um, these come in handy. You know, you're, Some of you are probably very familiar with them, but just keep in mind when you use them, some have special requirements with them. So AA, you know, you have to have a, a data point with the AA and the space in between. If you use AH, a comment's required with it. So keep that in mind when you use them because these are common issues why an error might happen when you're going to submit these reports. So here, if you're using the online entry form versus the Excel template, here is where this is a little more cumbersome when you're using the online entry form versus the Excel. So say you have a data point right here, say it's, or not a data point, but say it's AH, you use the AH code. AH requires a comment. So then you have to come down here, make sure you select the proper parameter that it goes with, and then you gotta make sure you select the proper date that the comment or that the AH symbol is representing. So here, so say, then then you can type in the, the excuse me, the um, actual message. But here, as you notice, this says 8-1. So if you were to type in something here, hit save, it's gonna add it to the date of 8.1, not 8.19, like this example shows here. So make sure you keep that in mind. It's just, you know, a few more buttons, like I said, to click to, to make sure that comment matches with the cell that you're trying to have it with. Um, whereas versus the Excel template, like before, oops, excuse me, like before you have the comment section right beside where your data point goes. So you can just put your data there, type a comment in there and be done. And make sure you always click add save if you are doing it this way, just to make sure that comment does save with your um, information. But again, this is why the Excel template comes in to easier play because you don't have to worry about these steps. So let's take one more question quiz here. So this question is, are you evaluating on a regular basis whether or not your facility is in significant non-compliance? Okay, I have launched the poll. So when it pops up, please make your selection, yes, no, or I'm not sure what that means. And it looks like most 
people have voted. If not, please make your final selection and I'll close the poll and share the results shortly. Okay, I'm closing the poll and sharing the results. Back to you, Jacob. All right, so good. So most of you are, that's always good. Um, if you don't know what that means, you can always reach out to your permit um, inspectors for your facility. They can always get you in contact with the correct group here at the EPA, the compliance section. Um, they can explain, you know, the best ways to, you know, be proactive about it. So, you know, you don't want to have an issue and then have to figure out how to fix it. You would rather be, you know, proactive with it so you'd never have to um, be out of compliance. Um, yeah, so just keep that in mind. Those are the people that you can contact. And a lot of you might have been talking with Donna Deswar. Um, she is also in the compliance section at the EPA, and she can also help you with those issues. All right, so say you have a report that you're getting ready to submit. You get all the way towards the end before you're ready to submit, and you see this warning message right here. You can still submit when this warning message pops up, but I caution you to make sure you click on it and see what it's, why it's telling you there's a warning. A lot of times it's has anything to do with the frequency. Say you have one per day and you just missed a day by, by accident. You forgot to enter the data in there, the sample in there. So it's pulling that because it sees, hey, I need to have something every day of the week, but you've missed one. So that's why it might be showing that error. Another common reason is the image on the right here. So say you have a frequency of two per week, two samples per week, and you looked at your calendar and you based it off that and you have your two samples for the week, but then when you go to enter it in the online form here, it might be on the 7th and the 8th of the month. On the calendar, that might look all right and they might be within that same week, but in our system, it counts that as one sample was taken for that week and one sample was taken for the next week. That's another reason why this Excel template is so useful because we have it broken down into the into the weeks that you need to sample for. So days one through seven are always the first week. And then the second week, as you can see, we have it distinguished between highlighted and yellow, just so you can see clearly what the weeks are. And then you have days eight through 14, which is the second week. So keep that in mind when you're taking samples to make sure that they do fall within what the system is looking for. It might be right on your calendar, but it might not be right within the system's template. So keep that in mind so you don't have any issues when you go to submit. So some common war warnings or issues you can have when you go to submit is if you have a red error message. So on the page before where I had the warning, sometimes you'll have a red issue, or a red highlight that says click here to fix this. You always have to click the red in order to submit. The red will not let you submit in the system. So for this example here, it's AH. And AH always has to have a comment. In this case, they forgot the comment. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so it needs the comment associated with it so you can continue to submit. And then if you see a green warning, so green does not mean go, contradictory to what we all know to be true. <laughs> um, green is just telling you, hey, this is seems a little out of range from what you've submitted in the past on EDMRs. So it wants you to check it. So make sure, if you're not sure of what to do here, check your permit. Note that, you know, find zinc in your permit, see what it has for the max and minimum, and make sure you're still in, you know, in the range of it. Because your permit might be, is gonna be different than someone else's. So you might have a special limit, whereas they might not. The system just has a very general, general range um, because we can't, you know, keep it unique to every single type of permit that's out there. That's just, just too many. So just keep that in mind. Green does not always mean go. Just check it to make sure that your sample is still within the legal range that your permit says. And if it is, that's fine. You can ignore it and continue to submit. If it's not, you might have to, you know, fill out an additional form to be, stay in compliance. And then once you actually do submit, here's a very similar page what you'll see here. This is the submission successful page. Please note it does say to make sure you go back and check that the submission went through successfully. Um, so down here in this bottom image, you'll see it says submitted transfer to SWIMS. That means we, the EPA, have received it and there's no more action that can be done on your part. If it says transferred, um, you know, error, error in submitting to SWIMS or anything other than this pretty much, it means we do not have it. So if you see that, feel free to resubmit again to try because maybe just some weird glitch happened in the system. 
and you just need to resubmit it to get it to go through. If that doesn't work, reach out to me and we'll work on getting it submitted for you. Sometimes it's something that we have to do completely on our side without you at all. But if there is something that we need you else to, you know, fix or try to submit again, we, we might reach out and request that you do that just to help get that through because we don't want anyone to get any, you know, violations with not submitting. And you can always reach us at this email right here, which will be in the end of the slide as well. So that's pretty much it for EDMR. Um, I know that might, you know, it might seem fast. There's a lot of information there. You'll have this slide, this presentation, this view at any time. I'll also be probably putting this on our website for you to view, but feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions for, with EDMR. You know, you, I'd rather help you in 10 minutes versus you trying to figure it out in two hours. You know, I don't want you to sit there for longer than you need to. So using streams. So stream is the other service available within the list of many services here. It's always gonna be, for well, for now, it's the longest link in our system. So keep in mind, you're always looking for the word streams. Here's where you're gonna click on to do something with the permit. This is where you're gonna submit for a new permit, renew a permit, modify a permit, create reports with your permit. And if you sold your business, you might have to transfer your permit. But that's where it's always gonna be done is here. And you can also terminate through here as well. So once you click on the facilities, or sorry, the stream service, it'll take you to your My Facilities page. If it's a brand new account, you won't really, you won't have anything here. This is like your personal profile page. You can add permits and remove them as often as you need to. Um, by removing it, it doesn't affect the permit itself. The permit information is always saved in our, our database. So this is just like your personal page where you can manage your permits that you're in charge of. In order to add your permit to your facility, so say you're a new, you know, you're a new employee onto this business, they already have a permit associated, but obviously you had to get your own account so you can manage the permits for them. And then you have to add it to your account. So up here, you would just click add facility slash permit. It's gonna ask you for the permit number. Just type it in like you see here without the version number at the end with the asterisk. And then you'll hit search, it'll find it, you'll select it, and then it'll take you back here and you'll be able to click on the actual permit facility itself. And likewise, if you're creating a new permit, you will be able to click on that option as well up here. This red bar is a new feature we have when we did one of our updates. It'll tell you if you are have an NOV with your permit. In order to resolve it, just locate the permit facility in question, and it'll have the, the, the triangle exclamation symbol right here. You can click on it and to, you know, to, to fix that issue with your permit. So here, once you actually click on your facility slash permit, it'll take you to the example page here. So say my facility was my name, and then you're gonna have a permit or permits underneath of it. Click on the permit in question that you need to work on. It'll have a drop down, and you'll be able to see anything that's been done underneath of it. In this case, this is shows an active permit. It's, it's a brand new one because it has the version of A, so you won't see any expired underneath of it. And then it looks like there's also four reports that are associated with this permit so far. The reports are only visible as long as you're the individual that submitted them. So if there might be other reports that you can't see on here that someone else has submitted, but then but that's just how the system is set up. You can only see what you submit. The second image here, this shows a brand new permit that's under I'm about to under construction, kind of makes sense. Um, it's, it hasn't been submitted yet by you. So that's where this application dropdown comes into play. So the draft is just a placeholder. It just tells me that somebody, some account user somewhere has created something for this permit. In this case, it's a brand new one where they can click on that application dropdown to continue working on the permit or submit it. Once the permit's issued, this draft will go away and it'll say active like up here. And then the second image down here, this is just an example of an active permit that's already been submitted, it's been issued, and nothing else has been done with it because nothing else needs to be done at this moment. And that's what that'll look like. So if you need to create a report or if you need to transfer anything with your um, permit, you always will go to your active permit. So find your active permit, click the actions button to the right of it, and you'll have these images, or these options, excuse me, down here. Renew is obviously a popular one that a lot of people need to do. That's where you can also modify the permit, create a report, or transfer. Something to keep in mind here that modify and transfer are not the same thing. Transfer is only when you sell 
a business, your business because it's, you know, the permit's getting out of your name, going to somebody else. That's how you start that process. And if you need help with that, obviously reach out to me. That is a little, there's a few steps involved with the transfer process. So just feel free to reach out and we'll get that sorted out for you. And then likewise, if you click create report, the image on the right here will show, and then your permit will have different reports associated with it. Not all these reports are included in every permit number, but just keep that in mind. You'll click your dropdown for your report, and then that's where you'll find to be able to create the report for your permit. So specifically about applications, so say like before you have that draft status up here, you have your application in edit mode, you still have to, you know, you might still be working on it. Someone might be having to go in to continue to work on it. Anybody can, as long as you delegate, so this feature right here, delegate, that's where you can send this application to somebody else so they can continue working on it. Anybody can work on these applications, but only the response official legal permit holder can submit them. So just keep that in mind. But that's how you would send it to someone else because not only the person that created it will see this originally. If you want someone else to see what you've been working on or you have to send it to someone else to submit, you always need to delegate. And of course, if you don't need it anymore, you need to start over, you can always delete. Um, save frequently, the system, you know, weird things happen. Sometimes data gets erased. Just save as frequently as you can to avoid any issues with that. Um, if you continue to have user issues, sometimes logging out, logging back in helps. Deleting your history or your web browser also helps with OHID and using the eBusiness Center services. If you're still getting some weird errors, weird things are happening, you can't figure out what's going on, obviously feel free to reach out and I'll work with you to get that resolved. So like I said here, draft means somebody has started something. In this case, it was me and I started this application for it. If you don't see this application dropdown, you just see this draft. That means somebody else has started something and you might need to reach out to either your colleagues to see who might have started it or you can reach out to me and I can look in our system to see what individual might have started it. A lot of times, sometimes someone will leave, they'll have started something but they never delegate it over to somebody else within the company to continue working on it. So in that case, you would have to reach out to me and then I can delegate on my end over to you so you can continue working on the permit that was started by the ex-employee. If you ever see something that says permit pending by your facility name, that does not mean you submitted a permit. I know it sounds contradictory. We will be updating this eventually to be more um, coherent with what it means, but this means that somebody has created a facility in the system, but they have not submitted a permit. Because if you click on it, it'll probably say, the system does not see any permits or applications for this facility. Um, so that's what that means. You just have to go in and do the create new permit option so whenever you do click create new permit, here's what it looks like right here. You have steps one, two, and three. Step one, you'll choose the permit that you want. Step two is where, you're, where you select a facility. If you don't have the facility, you would just have to do that. I don't see my facility I need and follow the additional steps to get that added. But in this case, the person added the facility, but they never submitted a permit. So now they can click that dropdown and the facility name will be there because it's here as well. So once you do that, then you can create the new permit application and start that process. So just keep that in mind. Some people think when they see this that they submitted something for the permit, um, but in fact, they have not. This example is an individual permit. For example, I just pulled this up for the purpose of these forms. If you are familiar or have seen the individual permits before, you'll know that you have to fill out at least one of these forms. When you click on edit for the form itself, there is usually an Excel template that has to be downloaded data has to be entered onto and then re-uploaded to the application. There has been issues with Microsoft that have updated their security protocols. So they have made it harder for some individuals to use Excel. When you see this, so normally what it will come up as, it'll say enable editing, you'll click that, you'll be good to go. You can enter and type in these cells, no problem. Sometimes you'll get this red bar. If you do, that means the system sees this as a security threat and it's preventing you from using it. So to get around that, there is a file button at the top left of Excel. If you're not familiar with Excel, feel free to reach out. I can walk you through a little process of using it. It's not super difficult for what you, you might need to do. But if you click file, you'll be brought to the page where you can like save, print the sheet. But if you go all the way down, there's an options button on the left-hand side. If you click that, it'll open up this dialog box here where you then click on Trust Center. From there, macro settings, and from there, 
you'll see enable VBA macros. They might be already enabled, that's okay. Just uh, click, you know, okay twice, and it still will probably be red, like the image before. That is okay. What you're gonna do then is then save it to your desktop. Once you save it, close out of it, reopen it, then it should have worked for you. And again, it's, it's Microsoft's thing, not ours. So it's just one of those annoying things we have to work around because of Microsoft's new security measures. And then just something to highlight, if you go to the end to delegate something and you can't find the person, most likely they have an OHID account, but they never actually set up their eBusiness Center account. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you're searching by their name, you know their name, you know their, you know, you might think you know their user ID number and you still can't find anything when you go to delegate to somebody, it's most likely they never created their second eBusiness Center account. So just have them do that or reach out to me and we'll get them sorted out so then you can send it over to them. And reports, again, this is just an example of the reports like I showed earlier when you click that drop down to create a report in streams. These are the guides that go with those reports. Um, these will be changing and being updated eventually, but for right now, they're, they're good for what they are and they have contact information on there if you need help filling those out. Of course, if you need help, additional help, please reach out to these emails here. Um, and of course, if you need specific help with the minimum staffing report, you can always reach out to the OpCert email or yeah email address and they'll be able to help you out over there specifically and then here's my information and donna's information if you can't get a hold of me try donna she is my backup for ebiz so one of us between the two will be able to reach out and help you with your your issues okay Thanks so much, Jake. Um, we have a bunch of questions that have come in and I know Donna's behind the scenes um, answering a lot of those. If we don't answer your question during the webinar, we will reach out to you via email afterwards. We are gonna go through a couple questions here and then I noticed that several people had asked for like a review on the um, responsible official delegation and the spreadsheet. Uh, we we don't really have time to go over that, so please reach out to Jake, or you can also, you'll get a link to the recording of the webinar. So you can actually, at your leisure, review the whole webinar, you know, hit pause, you know, go over that section uh, more slowly, because we did cover a lot of material today. Mm -hmm. So our first question is, can I share my eBiz account with a coworker to help me report? Yep, so that is a, a big no. Um, your account is your own information. You know, it has your personal address tied to it, um, things like that. That's stuff you don't want, obviously, probably want your coworker to know about you. Um, and remember, like I said earlier, if you go in as someone else logged into their account and submit something as them, you are therefore forging their signature on something that they are not aware of. So that's why these accounts cannot should not be shared. They are your own personal account. Okay, do I need a separate eBiz account for each facility I manage? No, so you only ever need one account for anything. Um, if you don't, if say if you move, um, excuse me, if you transfer to a different company, obviously the reports will change, you know, the permits will change. You don't have to submit things for that permit anymore because you don't associate with that facility. You can just easily remove those privileges from your account so you don't get um, notifications from the system for that facility anymore. Um, so that's why you can just, Remove ones you don't need and add ones you do need. So the accounts always will be one. Okay, and this will be our last question before we wrap up. Do I need permission from Ohio EPA to get EDMR service or do I need permission from the owner of the facility? So permission is always from the responsible official. They are your legal permit holder. They're in charge of the permit itself. Anything good or bad that happens with the permit is the responsible official's duty to know what's going on. So they're gonna be the ones that give you the actual permission, and then the EPA is the one that goes in and approves that request by the responsible official. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you for your great presentation. Um, again, if we did not answer your questions as they came in, we will be reaching out via email after today's session. And again, just a reminder, the webinar has been recorded. You will receive an email after the webinar with a link to the recording and a link to the session survey. And the survey will also pop up once the webinar ends. We value your feedback and we greatly appreciate it if you let us know how we're doing and let us know if there's anything we can do to further assist you. 
please note you will be sent your certificate of attendance in a separate email from an Ohio EPA staff member, and it's not going to come through the GoToWebinar platform. As a reminder, CEUs are available for this session. To receive credit, please respond to the questions about CEUs in the session survey. If you're seeking wastewater operator certification contact hours, please provide your core person ID in the post-webinar survey so we can submit on your behalf to the Certified Operator Program. To receive credit for REHS or REHS IT certification numbers, please respond to the question about CEUs in the survey. And let's take a look at our upcoming trainings. We'd like to invite you to, to join us for these. On October 2nd, we have our Recycling and Litter Prevention Grants kickoff webinar. On October 12th, we have NPDES permitting, new and proposed rules and policies. And on September 19th through the 21st, we have our free virtual sustainability conference and our registration's open for that. So to register for these upcoming webinars and conference, you can go to our agency event calendar and that's on our main agency webpage or if you go to the bottom footer of any webpage, you can find that events calendar link there. If you miss past webinars, you can go to DEFA's webpage at the link on the slide. Once you're on the DEFA webpage, click on the word training on the left-hand menu column. You'll find recordings of training you may have missed. You can also go to our agency YouTube channel to view recorded webinars. We'll post a recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel. It usually posts within a week of the webinar. We'll also post a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slides with the recording. And the YouTube channel link can be found at the bottom of each web page on the footer and the YouTube icons next to the Twitter icon on the bottom right side. To receive notifications of upcoming webinars, go to our Ohio EPA Resource Hub. You can create an account, then go to the option Subscribe to Updates. Then once you're there, select the option named All Trainings, Webinars, and Conferences. And you can go to the link on the slide, or the Resource Hub is also found at the bottom footer on each web page. With that, we're going to end today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us, and have a great day.